<laughs> so <laughs> it's good to be out this morning, and uh, looks like you got a good crowd, uh, or a crowd anyway, right? Y'all aren't gonna laugh. It's a, it's a good crowd. All right, it's a good crowd. <laughs> uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here this morning, and uh, you said we're gonna eat about noon, right? Right, we're gonna eat about noon. All right. I'll be. I'll try to. I'll try to keep it short and sweet for you. Um, but I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and a lot of a lot of faces that uh, recognize, a lot of don't recognize, and a lot missing. And I uh, hope everyone that's missing is doing well uh, this morning. But uh, I was thinking as the brother was speaking this morning in Sunday school, I got real spiritual for a moment, and uh, he was talking about death, and. Uh, how we don't know how long we're going to be here, and, and many people don't know what's going to happen happen to them when they perish or when they die, uh, especially outside of Christianity. And uh, the truth of the matter is, I, I was just just thinking of a song, just it just popped in my mind, and I said, "Get real spiritual." <laughs> so, but it reminded me of, of this old song. It's about a split home, but it was about a cardboard sign says "yard sale," real estate sign says "sold." Family picnic table holds all that it can hold. And some of you may know it and you may not know it. And you may think, well, I can't believe that you would say that from the pulpit. But the truth of the matter is this was about a broken home. But the truth is that it also applies to us when we're gone. Now, there's going to come a time in each of our lives when everything that we have and everything that we strive for and the things in this life are going to perish. And they're going to be sold at an auction or they're going to be sold at a yard sale. And they're not going to mean anything. I had some neighbors that I grew up with my whole life. And when they passed away, uh, family got their house. They didn't have any children left or anything of that nature. And uh, everything in their house, pictures and all this stuff, was just discarded uh, their whole life. And the history of them was erased just like that. And the truth of the matter is, if we don't have Christ, we don't have anything. And uh, we're all going to leave this world. And the question is, will we leave this world with Adam? as our federal head. In other words, Adam as our head or Christ. Sin or Christ. And if we don't leave with Christ, then we're going to be cast out into utter darkness. If you have your Bibles this morning, turn to John chapter 14. John chapter 14. I want to look at verses 1 through 3. John chapter 14, verses 1 through through three. The Bible says, a very familiar passage of Scripture, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Let's pray. Our Father, as I bow this morning in prayer, I'm thankful for your word, for the gospel. And Lord, I'm thankful for the history of the Old Testament that leads us to Christ. And Lord, shows us everything that you've done, Lord, to redeem those whom you've called. And Lord, what you're continuing to do, until you come again and receive us, that where you are there we may be also. And I pray this morning, Lord, that if there is anyone here this day that's lost, that before this day is over, you'd reach down from heaven with your hand that is not shortened, Lord, and touch their heart. Restore unto them, Lord, a heart of flesh in place of the heart of stone. and Cause them to call out upon your name that they may trust you, believe, Repent of their sins, and it may be counted unto them as righteousness. And God, I pray that you would be with the message this morning. Forgive me of my sins, and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. When I was thinking as I prepared for today about all the travels that my family have done and, uh, and how and they all know me when it's time. I mean, I enjoy the time that we're away, uh, whether it's a couple days, whether it's a week, whether it's a couple weeks. But a week or two is a great break, and then I'm really just ready to go home. <laughs> Anybody else like that? 
just I'm ready to go home. And the trip maybe out there maybe doesn't seem too bad, but often the trip back seems like it takes forever. There's nothing like the comfort of home. Uh, we've, we've stayed in some really nice places, and we've slept in some nice beds, and we've slept in some not-so-nice beds, but I've never slept in one that sleeps as good as mine, right? Now, I've never showered in a shower that was as nice as mine, uh, you know, and I've never sat on a couch or a recliner that was as comfortable as mine, right? And uh, so it's always nice to get home. But as I thought about this, I thought, you know, it's also nice to have a place, a church that you can call home. And for many of us, maybe that's here, uh, that this is your home church. But the truth of the matter is, most of us probably grew up somewhere else. Most of us probably learned the gospel message somewhere else. Maybe some of you uh, have been here since, since birth. Uh, and some of you are too old, so I know better. <laughs> so, but uh, uh, it's good to have a, a church that we can call home. You know, a place where we can go where you've been loved and where you've been taught and where you've been cared for, where you've been treated. And, and whatever the case may be, I don't know what makes that place your home church. And for us, you know, I grew up uh, in a different type of church, and my wife grew up in a different type of church, and that's not a place that, that I can call home now because the gospel is just not, it's perverted there. Not terribly perverted, but it, but it is. And we d just have a doctrinal disagreement. I can't call that place home anymore, so for about the last 12 years, this is kind of where we've called home. And uh, we've been loved here, and we've loved everybody here, and we've seen uh, some come, we've seen some go, and um, those many that we've seen go have went on to be with the Lord, and we know that that's where they're at today. But we've never, or you have never, rather, ceased to love us and show us that love. And truthfully, one day, well, let me say this. It's always good to be home, okay? It's always good to be home. But one of these days... We're going to say that for the last time. Amen. And it's not going to be while we're standing here in Metathorpe. It's not going to be while you walk into your door after a vacation or after a hard day at work. It's not going to be if you go home to your mom and dad's house. It's going to be when we get to heaven. And for the last time, we say it's good to be home. You know, Abraham longed for the day that he could say that it was good to be home. And one of these days, our pilgrimage on this earth is going to be over, and we're going to go somewhere. And for all of us that are saved, we're going home to be with the Lord. And I'm not in a hurry to end my pilgrimage here, and I'm sure none of you are either. But we'll sure be glad when we do get home. And I want to speak this morning on the topic of heading back to Eden. And it'll all come together and make sense when I get done. I talked to Brother Rob uh, yesterday. And I was just finishing everything up, and he asked me what I was preaching on. And I said, well, I'm, you know, I don't really have a title yet. And so I kind of tried to, to give him just a, an overview of it without going through the whole thing. And uh, as I have a, a, a tendency sometimes to start here and, and, uh, and have to circle all the way around to get back to where I started, okay? And uh, so I said, I, you know, I tried to explain it to him. He said, he said, so heading back to Eden. And I was like, exactly, that's the title of it, heading back to Eden. <laughs> so uh, so I, I, I stole that from him, uh, the title, but not, nothing else. Um, but uh, anyway, so it's good to be here this morning. And I know that there's going to come a time when we're all going to say it's good to be home and we're going to be at home with Jesus. But I want to roll back for just a few minutes. Let's go back to Genesis. I used to, uh, when I was younger, I used to make fun of Ken Ham a little bit because he would uh, always go back to Genesis. And uh, I thought, you know, there's more to the Bible than Genesis. You know, we can, we, there's more to it. But truthfully, the, Genesis is the book of beginnings. And if you don't have the book of beginnings, you really don't understand the rest of Scripture. And we can take everything from every book in the entire Bible all the way back to Genesis, and we can find their beginnings there. And in Genesis chapter 2, God's holy word tells us that he planted a garden in the east in a city of Eden. And there he placed man and gave him a helper. Now we know here uh, in verse 1, the heavens and the earth were finished and a host of them. And God blessed in verse 3, the seventh day. And uh, he begins to give us the generations of the heavens. And we see all that takes place here. And we get to verse 16, and God commanded man, gave him one simple command, you can eat of all the trees of the garden, but you cannot eat 
of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. So God placed man here in the garden. He gives man a helper, woman. He names, uh, Adam names her Eve, and he gives them power over all of creation. Now, God says, I'm going to give you the power over this earth, and you're going to rule this earth in my stead. That's what Adam and Eve had. They were going to rule this earth in his stead. Now, this Eden was a sort of temple. I don't want to say it was a sort of temple. Let me just say that this Eden was a temple, okay? And if we move forward into Leviticus, we can start to see all of this come back to, to play, and we can see how Eden was a temple. But it not only was a temple, it was paradise, and it was man's home, and it was where God would meet with Adam and walk with Adam and Eve, right? This was the place where one day God was going to live, we might say. Now, outside this temple... We may not see this in Genesis, but if we really take a broader look at the scope of what God had created, we know that he created this Eden, and he put up man in Eden, but that wasn't the whole earth. There was still an earth out beyond Eden, and man's job and responsibility was to bring that earth under subjection, to subdue it for the glory of God, right? Now... Eden was to be expanded to the four corners of the earth. And they were to reproduce, and they were to fill Eden with godly seed, image-bearing seed, bearing the image of God. And with each new generation, with each new child that was born, there was a message that was to go out. Now many of you might be thinking, yep, got to trust the Lord, got to trust the Lord. And yes, that is the message. But truthfully, what they were to tell the offspring, you can eat of all the trees of the garden, but of this tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and the day that you eat of that tree, you'll surely die, because that was the word of the Lord. Right? This was the word of the Lord. And then they would proceed to explain to them how God had created them and how God expected them to take dominion over the earth and to go forward and tell the next generation, you may eat of all the trees of the garden, but of that tree, and the day that you eat of that tree, you shall surely die. That was the message that they were to give to the offspring that they would have. Believe God and live. Believe God and live. And this would cause the whole earth to be filled with image bearers that would never cease to bring God glory and to praise His name until one day the earth would be full of God's people and finally He would come and live with them forever. You say, well, how do you know that's the plan? Well, because Genesis is the beginnings and we find throughout Scripture what the end is going to be and we're going to get to that. But we know that Adam and Eve sinned in the garden. They failed. They didn't believe God. And instead, they believed Satan. And that may, to some people, that may come as a shock to say, wait a minute, are you telling me they didn't believe God and that they believed Satan? Absolutely, that's what happened. Because God said, you eat of it and you'll die. Satan said, ah, God, wants you to, God just don't want you to be like him. And they said, oh, well, we kind of would like to be like him. So let, let's eat of it. And they ate of it. And this, this is how we know they didn't believe God and instead believed Satan. Because of this, they were plunged into sin. And when they were plunged into sin, all the offspring that they would have were also plunged into sin. And Adam and Eve were separated at this point from God. Not only were they separated, but they knew they were separated. And they hid from God as if God wouldn't know where they were at. They hid from God. And death was now imminent. And sorrow and pain and suffering were what were coming in the wake of sin. Now since this city of Eden was the place where God lived with man in the temple, and Adam and Eve were now living in sin and open shame and, and in, in rebellion to God, God banished them and cast them out of Eden into a chaotic earth that they had not yet brought under subjection as God had commanded. Now you just imagine, you say, well, what do you mean by a chaotic earth? Well, we find shortly after God cast them out of Eden that He explains to them that they'd be forced to live among the chaos while trying to subdue the earth because the subduction of the earth still had to take place. 
The problem is now it wouldn't be the seduction of the earth for the glory of God. It would be the seduction of the earth for the glory of man. Right? This is what man does. They sin and they, and, he subdue, and they subdue the earth for their glory. And we find that in Cain when Cain kills Abel. But they were cast from the presence. They would be forced to live among the chaos while trying to subdue this earth through the thorns, through the thistles, through the weeds and the heat and the cold and the drought. Right? And soon after Noah's flood, there would be flooding and there would be major snowstorms and all of these things. But not only that, death and murder and rape and sickness and pain and sin and all the other chaotic things that prevent and prohibit man from being able and capable of easily subduing the earth as God had intended. Never again would sinful man be able to subdue the earth as God had commissioned Adam and Eve to do, and never again would man know the beauty and peace and comfort of home unless someone somehow could undo what Adam in his sin had done. If they could live sin-free and in complete obedience to God, every word that God spoke, this person would have to be obedient to. And not only would they have to be obedient, but they would have to overcome the tempter. The tempter. They would have to overcome the tempter. And not only would they have to overcome the tempter, but now since sin is already present, they would have to die as a sacrifice for that sin in order or so that order could be restored no more would man have the comfort of Eden until that time and yet generation after generation of mankind tried to build cities we read of that in Genesis man after man and city after city make sinful attempts to build that perfect city and one by one they all fall captive to sin and they're eliminated in one way or another by war, by disease, by tor turmoil, by, by, by flood, by, by drought, by death, or by judgment of some form. Now as we read through Genesis, we move on and we find that the world becomes more chaotic. Shortly after sin has entered the world, uh, Adam and Eve have two sons, and uh, Cain and Abel, and we know that Cain kills Abel. Uh, just simply, I, I believe, in my mind, I fathom that Cain thought he would be the promised seed, and, and uh, Abel thought he would be the promised seed. I, I don't know. And, and when Abel offered his offering and God accepted it, Cain got jealous, thinking maybe Abel's the promised seed. And so Cain said, well, I'll take care of that. I'll get rid of him, and there is nobody else, right? And uh, I don't know if that's what happened, but here's what I know is that the world plummets into chaos and the first two people we hear of being born one kills the other it's crazy how chaotic it gets and how quickly it gets there the world becomes more chaotic cities uh, that try to mimic paradise don't work out and soon God chooses to destroy the earth by a flood when we get to Noah he sees the world is in too far gone, you might say. He repents the Lord that he made man, and he says, I'll destroy, but I'll save Noah alive, because in my eyes, he's righteous. And he saves Noah and his family alive. And once they get off the ark, you know what God does? He commissions Noah with the same commission he commissioned Adam with, go forth and replenish the earth. And the plan is... And we know it's not going to work. God knows it's not going to work. It's a picture of the plan. But the plan is that Noah, being righteous, getting off the ark and there's no more sin left, that Noah would go forth and produce good offspring, right? But he can't. Why? Because he's in sin as well. And he's a picture of something greater to come. We see this in Moses. We see it in many of the men. And it's only a few chapters later that we find man building a city in Genesis chapter 11. Man building a city. I'm not going to read it. I'm just going to give you the, the story. You can read it if you want. They build this city to make a name, and it's not to make a name for God. See, Eden would have made a name for God. But Babel was going to make a name for man. They said, let's go and let's just make brick, and let's build a city that's towers, reaches heaven, that we might what? Be like God. You say, well, that's not what they said, but that's what they were trying to do. They were trying to be like God. 
And the same thing applies to them as applied to Adam. And if you want to know the truth in every man and woman's life that we can find in Scripture, the same temptation reaches them is that I could be like God. You know what got a hold of the kings in their heart is I could be like God. That's what got a hold of Adam and Eve. That's what got a hold of all of these people. That's what Satan tempted Jesus with. I'll give you everything. You can be like God. But Jesus was God, and we'll get to that. But instead of doing what God said, they said, let's build this tower, let's build this city. We don't want to scatter across the face of the earth. That was, that was what God told them to do. Scatter across the face of the earth until the four corners are filled. But they said, no, let's don't do that. Let's build this city. Now here is where God confounds the language. This is a very unique passage of Scripture. He confounds the language so that man cannot continue the quest of building a city like they were building. He said, it's, nothing's going to be withheld from man. They're going to be able to accomplish anything. And imagine if God had not confounded the language in that day, what man would have accomplished in sin. Now we find later in the book of Acts, God releases that uh, language barrier. And you say, wait a minute, we all still have all these different languages. Well, God releases the language barrier through the gospel is what happens. And that was the purpose here is to stop them from doing the opposite of what God had asked them to do. And so in the book of Acts, what we find is God gives that, uh, gives, that takes away that language barrier. And the gospel, no matter what language it spoke in, does the same thing. It reaches into the heart of man, it penetrates, and it gets a hold of them so that Christ can bring them into the sheepfold and fill this earth with, guess what? Image-bearing seed. As time marches on, we see that man continues to build similar cities in attempt to create the perfect city and to be like God. And as a matter of fact, we all know, and if you don't know, you find out right now that there's been for years and decades an initiative to create a one-world government. And that the purpose of this, uh, you, you hear it all the time, well, we just want peace. Can we all not just come together and get along and, and, and all of this stuff? And the truth of the matter is everybody wants to come together and get along on the precept of here's what we believe. You know, and, and, and what we believe is that we can all do whatever we want to except you guys that want to serve the Lord. Now, you can't do what you want to do because we don't like it. And that's what every city has been about since the city of Eden. Now people say, well, this country was founded on godly principles. Well, you need to go back and read history because, my friends, this country was not founded like you might think. But time marches on, we see men build similar cities, we see them try to create perfection, but none are successful. All of them, every single one, is an attempt to mimic God for man's pleasure. And each one glorifies man and man's sin and magnifies man rather than magnifying and glorifying God's name. So as we peek on through Scripture, God calls a Gentile man by the name of Abram Remembering the promise that he made to Adam and Eve that there would be an offspring and that offspring would bruise the serpent's head while the serpent uh, would crush the serpent's head while the serpent bruised his heel, he calls Abraham and commission or Abram commissions him to leave his home and go to a new place that he would call home. He was going to go to a new home. And he promises Abraham that his offspring will inherit this land, this new land, and be given. Not just this new land, but a land free of enemies. A land of milk and honey. A land that produces. A land that's wonderful. Now, we oftentimes, it's, it's, it's maybe easy to see this in, in, in a physical form. But the truth of the matter is, this promise was spiritual. Of course, there was a physical application to it. But the, the truth of this promise is spiritual. Abraham was going to inherit a land that was spiritual, a land that flows with milk and honey, a land that is perfect in every way. And we understand this twofold nature. And Hebrews helps enlighten us a little bit. In Hebrews chapter 11, verses 8, if you want to turn there, Hebrews 11 and 8. 
8 through 12. The Bible is very descriptive in this. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out and he didn't know where he was going, but he went anyway. And by faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward, forward to the city that had foundations, whose designer, whose maker and builder was God. You know what Abraham was searching for? A land not made by hands. And my dear friends, we can say, well, Abraham was looking for, for, for a physical land, but Hebrews tells me what Abraham was truly looking for was a land not made by hands. Now, I want to say to the saints here at Meadowthorpe Baptist Church this morning that I would present to you that this can mean nothing else, nothing more and nothing less than the new Jerusalem that John, the revelator, sees coming down out of heaven in Revelation chapter 21. If you want to turn there, Revelation chapter 21, the Bible says in verse 1, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Now look at verse 10. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy city, or the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. Now look at verse 22 through 27. And I saw no temple therein. Wait a minute, a city without a temple? That sounds like Eden, doesn't it? Because I didn't see anything about a temple in Eden. Well, a city without a temple, well, that must mean that there was something special about this city. For the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it. For the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Listen to that. They shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. And there shall in no wise, notice this, there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now you say, so what are you trying to tell me? Well, I'm trying to tell you is that Abraham longed for a city where there'd be no enemies. God promised a city where there'd be no enemies. Abraham longed for a city more than the physical land of Jerusalem. Abraham longed for the new Jerusalem. Now we can fast forward from Abraham, skip all the way to Joshua. That takes us from, uh, from uh, Jacob and, and, and Esau and takes us to the 12 tribes to, and to Joseph in Egypt and across the Red Sea and through Sinai and uh, into Jericho and, uh, and marching into the promised land after the generation that didn't believe God were all dead and Moses has been taken up on the mountain and he's been buried and Joseph is leading the people the army of God, and they march into the promised land, believing every promise of God. And when we see that they come into the promised land, we see that God keeps every promise that He had. We can study Scripture and we see that men looked down and gazed upon the people and said, they're as the stars of the sky and as the sand on the seashore. Promise fulfilled. Prophecy fulfilled fulfilled the numbers of physical Jerusalem or, or yeah physical Jerusalem physical physical Israel rose to epic proportions that people would look down they feared them they feared this nation this new nation that seemingly came 
from nowhere. And God makes every promise come true and leads him into the promised land. And the physical home that Israel had longed for since God promised it to Abraham many years before is finally under their feet. But as we read the history of Israel, we find it's not long before they despise the promises of God. They despise the land and they're taken captive for not believing God. And time and again, Israel turns their back on God and then they turn back to God. And time and time again, God goes and gets them and He brings them back. He goes and gets them and He brings them back. And He goes and gets them and He brings them back. Why? Because God wants to dwell with His people. So He continues to bring them back. In Matthew chapter 24, in the New Testament, <clears throat> Jesus prophesies of the total destruction of Israel in the temple. Now you've got to think about this. They've been taken captive and they've not, they've not owned Israel since and to this day. But at this time, they've not owned Israel Jesus prophesies of their total destruction when he comes out of the temple. They ask some questions about the temple and, and uh, they're, they're ad, uh, admiring the temple. And Jesus said, you know, there's coming a time when not one stone will be left upon another on, on, in this temple. And he makes this prophecy. And soon what we find is Israel is fully despising God by hating his only son. And we know the story of the landowner. And he's, he's got a piece of land and he gets a people to bring into this land, to work it and to uh, make it bear fruit so that he can come and collect this fruit. And he sends some to collect it and to kill them. That's the prophets, right? This is the, the, uh, the story that Jesus is giving us. And what happens is he sends more and they, they get rid of them. They just get rid of them all. And finally he says, you know what I'll do? I'll send my son and I'll bet they'll reverence him. They'll see him coming and they'll say, hey, that's the son of the landowner. We better take special care. He's coming for what's his. And the landowner's son comes up and you know what happens? They say, hey, here comes the landowner. We better kill him or he's going to take what's ours. And they kill him. You see, this time comes that they despise the Messiah and they crucify him on a cross. And within 40 years, in 70 A.D., the Roman Emperor Titus besieges Jerusalem with his army and captures and destroys it. And they erected an arch in memorandum of Titus to commemorate this victory. It's called the Arch of Titus. And I want you to understand that that arch still stands today to commemorate the destruction of Jerusalem. And Israel longs for that land and they long for the temple and they long for freedom from their enemies while they continue to despise their Messiah. You know what man longed for long before Israel came along is they longed for a land where there was no pain and there was no suffering, but they despised the God that could give it to them. You know what man longs for today is peace and love and harmony, but they despise the only one that can give it to them. No longer does God dwell among the Jews of Israel. He now dwells with the offspring of Christ. Why? Well, because they despised their Messiah and they hated Him. And to this day, they still don't believe that Christ was the Messiah. You say, you're saying that Jews don't believe? I'm saying the majority don't, just like the majority of Gentiles don't. You say, well, so what was the purpose of creation then? Why did God create this world? Well, He created this earth so He could dwell with His people. He created this earth for His honor and for His glory. And He destroyed and He rebuilt and recreated the earth through Noah's flood so that He might dwell with His people. He chose Abraham from Ur of Chaldees and sent him to a new home to be the father of a new people, a different people and a peculiar people so that God might dwell with His people. He commissioned the purity laws and the Deuteronomic covenant with Moses and with the tribe of Israel, the nation of Israel, that he might dwell with his people. He commissioned the building of the tabernacle in Sinai that he might dwell with his people. And I want to say to you this morning that he sent Jesus, his only begotten son, to come to this earth to die in our place, to have his, turn his back against his own son, to put all the burden of our sin and our guilt 
and the evil of this world, the, the shame and the unrighteousness upon his shoulders, and he emptied his full wrath on his only begotten son so that he might dwell with his people. And I want to say to you that he will one day dwell with his people in new creation. You want to know what the purpose is of creation? It's that God wanted to dwell with a people that cry out day and night, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. You know that God has withheld nothing from man in this world or the world to come. Those that love Him and believe Christ and believe His Word, nothing is held back from us. We stand to inherit everything that Christ inherits if we're saved. You may not realize it, but the Old Testament is a story about God's preparing a way for His Son to come set us free. And yet we hated Him. We despised Him. We ridiculed Him. We lied about Him. We were ready to accuse Him and falsely testify against Him and hand Him over to the world that we could rid ourselves of Him. You say, wait a minute, I didn't have anything to do with that. That was not me. Well, yes, it was. It was my voice that cried out, give us, bear of us. It was your voice that cried out and said, give us, bear of us. It was my voice that cried out, crucify Him, crucify Him, crucify Him. And it was your voice that cried out those same words. You see, you say, well, I know the Jews did that. Well, you did it too. And every man and woman and boy and girl on this planet has tried to rid the thought of Christ from their mind at one time or another. Why is that? Well, because we are stooped in sin. Israel's history is littered with a longing to go home. They still long to have the land that God gave them in complete freedom. But sin, just as it cast Adam from his home, cast Israel from theirs. And sin, just as it cast Adam and Israel from their home, will cast you from yours if you don't trust Christ. You may say, well, I don't know about all that. You might say, well, what about the land that flows with milk and honey and and uh, all of this stuff that they're supposed to they're supposed to have, uh, you, you say they got it, but but they're out of it. But they live there now. Well, I ask you a question: Does it flow with milk and honey for the Jews right now? Do they do they not have to worry about their enemies? No, I tell you, it doesn't flow with milk and honey. They've got enemies on every end. Always they're at war. Always they're at war. You know what the truth of the matter is? So are we. If we're lost, we're always at war with the God who's trying to tell us through His Word, through the preaching of His Word, you must be born again. In the book of Joel, chapter 1 through chapter 2, verse 27, the prophet proclaims that one day God's people will be brought back to the promised land and never again will they be ashamed. Now this prophecy looks forward to a time that's not yet fully consummated. But it's soon coming. Now in chapter 2, verse 28, we find precisely when and what the prophet spoke of. He looked forward in time and saw the Holy Spirit descend on the church as we see take place in Acts chapter 2. Turn to Acts chapter 2 if you want to. I'll paraphrase, but I want you to notice what the prophet says here in verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters will prophesy, your old men dream dreams, your young men see visions, and also upon the servants and handmaids in those days I'll pour out my spirit. Now, we know that this prophecy regards Pentecost and the church because Peter testifies to that in Acts chapter 2, verse 16 through 21. But this is what the prophet Spoke, or this is what was spoken of by Prophet Joel. By the Prophet Joel, this is Peter telling the people they're not drunk. They're, they don't, listen, this is what Joel prophesied about. In the last days it shall be, says God, that I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Young men see visions, your old men have dreams, and even my men servants and maid servants, I'll pour out my spirit. They'll prophesy. I'll show wonders. I'll show signs. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood, and this is all before the great and glorious day of the Lord. And whosoever calls on the name of the Lord 
shall be saved. And then we go back to Joel chapter 2, verse 30 to 31, and the prophet's language and the prophecy begin to sound a lot like uh, parts of Revelation and parts of the book of Romans as we read uh, verse 30. Then I'll work wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. What does that sound like? Does that not sound like the book of Revelation? That's because this is what Joel was talking about. And then verse 32, and I will be, it'll be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. What does that sound like? Well, it sounds like the book of Romans, doesn't it? This is the prophet making all of these prophecies that we see are coming true. Now I want to say to you, who are the called of God? Well, it's none other than those that call upon the name of the Lord. They're not a group of people from the Middle East. They're sojourners from every corner of the earth. It's every tribe and every tongue. And John, or Jesus clarifies this in John chapter 8, verse 37 through 46. He says, speaking to the Pharisees, I, I know that you're Abraham's seed, but you, you seek to kill me. And it's because my word has no place in you. I'm telling you, what I've seen with my father, and you're doing what you've seen with your father. And they answered him, Abraham's our father. And Jesus said, if you were Abraham's children, you'd do the works of Abraham. But you now seek to kill me. A man who's told you the truth, which I heard from God, Abraham didn't do this. Abraham didn't seek to kill me. You're doing the works of your father. And then they said, well, we weren't born out of sexual immorality. We have one father, God. And Jesus said, if God were your father, you'd love me. For I came from God and proceed into the world. I did not come from my own authority, but he sent me. Why do you not understand my speaking? And he tells them why. Because you cannot hear my word. You know why? Because the language was confounded to him. So you, you say Jesus was speaking a different language to the Pharisees. Yes, he was. He was speaking the gospel, and they did not comprehend that language. <clears throat> he says, "You're of my." F he says, "You are of, of your father, the devil, and you want to do the desires of your father." He goes on to tell him he was a murderer and all of this stuff. And he says, "You," he says, "I tell you the truth, and yet you don't believe me." He says, "Which of you convicts me of sin? If I speak the truth, why do you not believe me?" He says in verse forty-seven. This is important. He who is of God hears God's words, and therefore you do not hear them, because you are not. Of God. Now don't get mad at me when I say it's not Israel that's God's people. You can get mad at Jesus because I didn't say it, Jesus did. So then who are the called? Well, if it's not Israel, who is it? Well, I would submit to you that it's spiritual Israel. It's God's people that belong to God. It's those that believe, those that call upon the name of the Lord. It has been since before the foundation of the world been those that God would call, those that would be covered by the blood and, and of Him that came from Mount Zion. It's you and me. And as the prophet Joel says, it's those who call upon the name of the Lord. And Jesus says, those who hear God's word and believe Him, it's those that believe Christ who was crucified on Mount Calvary and is setting free the very captives whom the Father has given Him one by one, those that call upon His name. And this same Christ has ascended to the Father to prepare a home for His people that call upon His name so that one day He might return and receive us, that where He is, there we might be also. And in that passage of Scripture of John chapter 22, or ch chapter 14, verse 22 says that uh, as Jesus is still speaking on this topic, it tells us that Judas, not the betrayer, Iscariot Judas, but a different Judas, asked Jesus how it is that he would reveal himself to his people and not to the world. And Jesus answered him and says, If a man loves me, he'll keep my word. My Father will love him, and we will come to him. And I want you to notice this. Make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my word. So who is it that the Father will abide with? Well, it's those that keep his word word it's the elect and i want to say to you this morning my friend that the next life is just a heartbeat away for those of us that are saved home is just a heartbeat away you see adam may not have been able to keep the lord's command to replenish the earth with our image bearing seed but abraham he couldn't bear seed that would uh, give the image of God like it was supposed to and Noah couldn't do it and, and uh, David couldn't do it but the truth of the man is uh, truth of the matter is no man 
could do it. Every man that trod on earth produced offspring that bore an image after Adam or after the man that produced that offspring. My children bear my image. I bear my father's image. And he bears his image all the way back to Adam. And it's a sinful image that we bear. You say, well, we're still made in the image of God. I understand that. But the image that we bear is not that of God. It's that of Adam and of sin. But the truth of the matter is, I'm thankful that although Adam couldn't do it and Moses couldn't do it and, and, and Abraham couldn't do it, Joshua and Jacob and, 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 and Joseph couldn't do it, I'm thankful that what they could not do, Christ has done. Christ has done what could not be done in full flesh, in full godly form, in that hypostatic union that Christ came in to trod this earth of sin and strife. In just 33 and a half years, His life was cut short, but He kept every word of the Father, and not one did He let fall to the ground. Not one word was lost. Every word He kept that the Father gave Him. And though Adam and Eve succumbed to the temptation of the devil in the Garden of Eden, when they should have taken the office of prophet, priest, and king, and acted in a godly manner with it and cast him out of the garden. That's what Adam should have done. He should have said, hey, God said this. I'll not hear it. Get out of here and leave my family alone. But he didn't do it. But in the wilderness, you know what happened? Satan came to Jesus and he offered the same thing. Uh, you want to be like God? And Jesus said, you know what? Get behind me. And Jesus overcome and triumphed over Satan just as was prophesied. And shortly after this triumph, he crushes the serpent's head on the cross. And what Satan meant for evil, God meant for the reconciliation of the world. And Jesus has now therefore reclaimed the title deed and dominion of the earth that Adam lost and is now bringing it under subjection to himself as he reaches down into the kingdom of darkness one by one, a kingdom filled with people that believe Satan. And one by one he pulls them and plucks them out of Satan's hand, places them in his kingdom, and his kingdom grows, and it'll grow, and it'll grow, and Satan's kingdom shrinks, and it shrinks, and it shrinks. Until one day, finally, Jesus is going to come back to this earth. He's going to cast out every soul that does not believe God. They're going to be cast out into utter darkness. He's going to recreate this earth. And once again, we're going to be in Eden, in New Jerusalem, and everything that God has promised throughout all of Scripture, I'm going to hold. I'm going to see. I'm going to feel forever and ever. And I want you to understand, Jesus is restoring right this moment what Adam lost. And there's one way to be a part of that restoration, and that is to trust Christ as your Savior one day, Scripture tells us that every knee is going to bow, every tongue is going to confess. But I want to say to you, when that day comes, that confession means nothing. That bent knee means nothing except for to glorify the God that you're going to go to hell knowing could have saved you from your sin. Could have restored you. Made you new. And kept you out of hell. Kept you free from the judgment of God. I say to you this morning, let Christ take your judgment and trust Him. Let His righteousness replace your filthy rags and cast yourself upon the rock before that rock is sent to crush His enemies. Believe Christ. Believe that He died. Believe that He rose again. Believe that He's coming again to receive His own. And trust Him. Come home. You who are weary, come home. You that are broken hearted, come home. You that don't have a home, come home. You that are weary and worn and sad, come home. You say, well, I'm young. I'm not really weary. I'm not really worn. I'm not really sad. Well, I'll tell you what. You're on your way to hell if you're not saved. And that's weary, worn, and sad. You're naked and ashamed. You say, I'm fully clothed, but you're naked your righteousness is as filthy rags and you stand naked before God. Come home. Come to Christ and trust Him as your Savior. I want you to listen one more time. John chapter 14. Turn there with me and I'm done. John chapter 14. I went longer than I wanted to, but that's all right. 
because I don't, I don't have to face you after today until he brings me back next time. <laughs> John chapter 14, verse 1, the Bible says, Let not your heart be troubled. Well, why does he say that? Well, he says, You believe in God, believe also in me. You know what that tells me? Is that if you don't believe in God, your heart is troubled. Believe in God. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I wouldn't lie to you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you. Where I am, there you may be also. Amen. He is coming back. That return is just over the horizon. It can happen at any time. And when He comes back, Life is done. You'll either enter that paradise 